And now, Daljit Dhaliwal. In an apparent break from his predecessor, President Obama has openly lobbied for direct talks with Iran. Now those overtures are overshadowed by the recent trial and conviction of American-Iranian journalist Roxana Sabiri. To discuss the impact of her imprisonment on future relations is Babak Yaktefa, the editor-in-chief of Washington Prison. Babak, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. Roxana Sabiri has a dual U.S. and Iranian citizenship. Yes. citizenship. Why doesn't um, Iran recognize her U.S. citizenship? Well, as far as Iran is concerned, you only are, you're an Iranian citizen unless in some shape or form you rescind that and you say that you do not want, wish to be a citizen of Iran any longer. And the situation with the Iranian Americans are is that they do hold two passports. Uh, they have the option, I should say, that they have. And once they travel to Iran, uh, they use their Iranian passport essentially to kind of uh, uh, circumvent the issue of getting a visa and waiting for it. And, and, so this is and common knowledge stuff. among the it Iranian people. It is common knowledge. People do it all the time. Exactly. But then what it allows, unfortunate, some unfortunate circumstances, uh, a situation such as this, is that once, for whatever reason, a person is in trouble in Iran, then this allows the Iranian government to say, well, this person entered with an Iranian passport, they are Iranian citizen, and they're, they're, they're Iranian subject, therefore it's an internal matter and uh, she's not being treated as there were other situations as American citizen but rather as Iranian citizens and that's how they deal with it. Does her US citizenship also become problematic? Uh, it does. Actually, it, what it does become, unfortunately, as we have seen, as I said, there has been cases, as you know, uh, uh, prior to this, it becomes more of a political uh, uh, game. And, and it seems that we, we keep uh, uh, this the repetition of this goes on, where essentially for some procedural reasons, uh, these folks get arrested or, or get called in. Uh, and then uh, you, you first you hear from some government official that they're going to be released within a matter of days and it's not that big a deal, but then it becomes this headline news and it usually ends up taking a, a turn for the worse before things settle down and maybe uh, get, get resolved. Uh, and, and, and the way you really have to look at it is that there are many layers to this. First and foremost, particularly in regards to Iran Americans and some of these arrests that we've seen, it's an indication that there are as many people uh, in Iran uh, who are in some shape or form against any form of rapprochement between Iran and the United States, as there are in the United States uh, these, as well. These elements are milk. They, exactly. Well, it becomes very sentences. political. And, and I also found it very interesting that, in fact, today uh, there was a letter by uh, this gentleman, a former ambassador to, or, uh, to Jordan, Iranian ambassador to Jordan, who is in Britain right now. He's been there for 30 months. He's about to be uh, extradited to the United States uh, to uh, uh, be put on trial. And he considers himself uh, 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 a prisoner, just like Roxana Sabari, uh, saying, why isn't anybody doing anything for him while the whole world is paying attention to Roxana Sabari? So again, there are many different groups that are trying to, to turn this into some, some political game and get something, something out of this. And what about President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad? Is he also milking this? I mean, what was the point of him well, sending this letter saying that she would get better representation in the court? Exactly, which again was something that was unexpected. I think. In in a way, he, he was trying to maybe undermine uh, the supreme leader because if you remember, there was a situation with another Iranian-American, uh, Mrs. Esfandiari, Hal Esfandiari of Woodrow Wilson, uh, where the, the president of Woodrow Wilson, uh, Lee Hamilton, sent a letter to the supreme leader asking him to intervene and, and, and allow her to leave the country. And I think in this way, with the Iranian elections coming up, uh, June 12th, and, and with some of the problems that Mr. Ahmadinejad is facing and some of the challenges he's facing for, uh, for a second term, I think this also kind of plays well for him, saying that uh, regardless of what the Western media may say about us and, and, and our human rights, here I am really trying to, uh, to uh, uh, highlight this, this case and, and, and say that you know, we do treat everyone uh, uh, well and, and equally well. And uh, it is that you know, she, she has been found to be spying or whatever the charge may be, but we are doing the best that we can. And will Iranians vote for him on that basis? I mean, is that going to play well to the electorate? Will they believe that? I mean, is that a credible enough argument? Uh, to, the thing to is that you have to realize that inside of Iran, a lot of these issues, be it Roxana Sabari, be it enrichment, uh, uh, uranium enrichment, and other issues that, it's, that play so big in, in, uh, uh, outside of Iran, does not play as much in Iran. In Iran is still economy. It's still the issue of whether or not uh, they, can, they can hold on to their jobs, they can afford housing and things of that nature. And on that front, Mr. Ahmadinejad has not 
done well. He is in, 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 in trouble, if, if you want to look at it that way. However, uh, if you go outside of major cities, the Tehran, Shiraz, and so on and so forth, you would still see a good deal of support for Mr. Ahmadinejad, for the way that he presents himself as a man of the people, doling out money and cash here and there. And another element is the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the guardians of the uh, Islamic Revolution, the, the militia corp, who are the higher echelon of them, who are still supportive of Mr. Ahmadinejad. Uh -huh. A uh, rapprochement between the United States and Iran, uh, talks about talks, people meeting on the sidelines of conferences, uh, clear all this up for us. Where is this going? Well, I don't think anything, personally, I don't think anything substantial is going to take place until at least after the Iranian president elections, which is going to take place June 12th. Uh, after that, I think there's a much more clear as to, at least from the U.S. perspective, who exactly will they be dealing with, even though the president of Iran is not necessarily the only person that the United States will be dealing with in regards to the bigger picture of, of the uh, rapprochement. Uh, there will probably be some, some meetings at some mid-level in regards to Afghanistan, probably maybe even uh, uh, Iraq. But I don't think anything substantial is going to take place. But also reading what Iranians are saying and looking at what they say, they, wa they want to see action and not talks. And, and, and it's uh, kind of ironic that uh, just a week before President Obama sent a, uh, uh, a New Year uh, video piece uh, congratulating the New Year to Iranian people and, and the leadership, which was kind of rare. Uh, but just a week before that, he renewed the Iran Sanctions Act. For the Iranians, this, this doesn't give the proper signal saying that you say one thing, that you want to establish relations and talks and so on. And meanwhile, you, you know, your action does not follow what, what you're trying to say. And there is still a great deal of mistrust. So it, it really has to be a very slow buildup. Uh, for this to take any place. But again, as I said, I think after the, uh, the Iranian presidential election, we might see uh, some steps being taken. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mohammed al Baradei, um, recently said that Iran should reciprocate to U.S. overtures, um, especially concerning Iran's nuclear program, its nuclear ambitions. What could um, a possible overture from Iran look like? What would be the context in which something like that could happen? Well, the one thing that, that I think we all have to at this point understand, and, uh, and you see this in Iranian uh, internal politics as well, is that nobody at this point is going to say that, that they're going to suspend any form of achievement or anything that's going to come across as Iran yielding ground to the demands made by five plus one or any individual country uh, on that. So whatever the case may be, and, and I think the Iranians are starting to put some plan together, will have to involve the continuation of the program they have, but possibly with maybe uh, uh, more, uh, more of, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, the NPT regime uh, being involved in checking to see and make sure that Iran does not pass a particular threshold in terms of its enrichment and also in regards to what does take place with the, with the uh, uh, spent fuel uh, that they have, be it building a consortium inside the, the country that's going to oversee that, or however it may be, but it will have to involve um, uh, a situation where, where Iran does not come across as, as losing face or losing ground on something that they have been building for the last three or four years as this national identity uh, and national pride. Uh, so it, it has to be to that level. But all along, they have said that they do not wish to make the bomb, uh, if you will. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the fear is that they will only be one step away from it. And that's what other countries are preventing Iran to do. Okay, well, good to see you again. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming along and talking with us. Thank you for having me.